Let the church say amen. amen. God is good. And all the time, amen, that seals the deal. (laughs) Hey, Children's Church is going on downstairs. If we have any young people who are up to age 12, you are free to go downstairs, but they've already started just a few minutes ago. Well, we had a, a wonderful time of fellowship last week as I was ordained and celebrated 10 years of ministry here at Zion Church, and I want to thank everybody for all the love shown to us and for all the cards and the the gifts and the encouraging words. Several of you thank me for preaching God's Word, and some mention how they are growing spiritually, and I appreciate hearing that. That, To me, that's the greatest compliment you can ever give your pastor. Um, one person in particular told me that at the church she used to attend, she never understood what the pastor was preaching about <laughs> because he wasn't preaching from the scriptures. I mean, what else is there? <laughs> but today is also a special day because it's the day we celebrate the Lord's Supper. This is a time when we remember the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. As we were just singing, Jesus gave his body to be pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. He poured out his blood for our redemption, amen? And he commanded us to do this in remembrance of him until he returns for us. But before we observe the Lord's Supper today, I want to take you back to the book of Acts and focus on the origins of the church. I believe we can learn some important truths and principles that we can still apply to us today. The Bible says we are one body with one Lord Jesus Christ, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So today I want to just take a few verses from Acts chapter 2 and go back and look at the first church and see some of the important aspects of what it means to be a healthy church body. And one of the things I want to point out to you, first of all, is that a healthy church body gathers around the Word of God. We are devoted to God's Word. The book of Acts was written by a man named Luke, and it's the same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke. In case you're not aware, Luke was a medical doctor, and he was actually a a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. As you read through the book of Acts, you'll notice when you get to Acts chapter 16, it's written in the first person. That's because Luke is writing it as a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 2 opens up with the day of Pentecost, you may recall. The promised Holy Spirit comes and fills all of those 120 believers who are in the upper room. And they're armed with the Holy Spirit, and they go out into the city of Jerusalem, and they have the ability to preach the gospel to all the people that are there from every nation who have come to Jerusalem to worship. And then Peter goes on to preach this powerful, magnificent sermon, and 3,000 people repent and choose to follow Jesus. Now, that's a good day in church, amen? (laughs) But these new converts, they devoted themselves to two uh, activities primarily, the apostles' teaching and fellowship. The apostles' teaching and fellowship. Now, the apostles' teaching would include the New Testament. They didn't have the New, uh, the Old Testament, rather. They didn't have the New Testament like we do. And so the apostles would teach from the Old Testament scriptures as well as teachings of Jesus that he had given them while he was here on the earth and the revelations he gave the apostles from heaven. But the scripture says these early Christians gave priority to the revealed word of God. Look at Acts 2, 42 and 43. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. I imagine the apostles would have taken time and talked about Jesus and showed them from the Old Testament all of those scriptures that pointed to Jesus as Messiah. They even performed miracles that were just like Jesus, and these miracles authenticated that what they were saying was true. 
So as a church, there has to be some common ground for us, some things that bring us together. It's not our hobbies or interests because we all have varied interests. But we are united through Jesus and his word, amen? That means when we come together as believers, yeah, we can talk about all those other things, but most importantly, we talk about Jesus. We talk about his word and how his word is at work in our lives. So when we gather around the word of God, we come to learn about Jesus. We want to see how the scriptures point to him. We want to confess our sins to him. We want to receive his grace. We want to remember his sacrifice on the cross for our salvation. We want to celebrate his resurrection and ascension. And we want to grow in his grace and knowledge. Jesus is the one who unites us. Amen. Despite our different backgrounds and preferences, we gather around Jesus and his word. Now, if you want to be a spiritual, healthy Christian, you don't open up your Bible just on Sunday. Can I get an amen to that this morning? You need a steady diet of the Word all week long. Otherwise, you're going to be malnourished. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, excellent verse that reminds us, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk of the Word that by it you may grow up into salvation. Long for the milk of the word. And then eventually, as you feed on the milk, you get to the meat of the word. Anybody here like to eat? Oh, I don't want to ask that. Anybody here that doesn't like to eat? I think we all like to eat, amen? Some of us have a hard time fasting for 24 hours. Everybody likes to eat. You probably ate this morning before you got here. And that's the way we ought to be with the Word of God. Amen? You need it every day, just like you need breakfast. Well, they say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. No, it's the Word of God. Job in 23, 12 said, I have treasured the words of your mouth more than my portion of food. Oh, man, I wish we had that attitude. No, we wake up thinking about breakfast. You need to wake up thinking about the Word of God, amen? It breaks my heart to know that so many Christians waste their mornings on social media. And then they don't have time for the Word of God. May God give you a craving for His Word. So we come together around the Word of God. Another thing a healthy church does is we fellowship together. We fellowship together. Christianity is more than just a Sunday go to meeting. It's a lifestyle. You don't live one way on Sunday and then another way the rest of the week. Amen? So here's how it looked in the first church. So let's go back and look at Verses 42 through 45 this time. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That's what church is all about, y'all. Amen? That's what church is all about. Too many people think that this building is the church. This building is not the church. The church is a body of believers. Amen? The, The Greek word for church is ekklesia. You've probably heard that word before. That's the church, the ecclesia. Ecclesia means a called out assembly or a congregation. You are the church. We gather together in a building, but you are the church, the body of Christ. The church is made up of all those who have been called by God to do life together. 
Verse 42 says they devoted themselves to fellowship. The Greek word there is koinonia. Maybe you've heard that word before. Koinonia, yes, it means fellowship, but it also means communion. It means participation. It means sharing together, and that's why you see these people sharing. That's why they were willing to sell their property, to sell their possessions, to help each other out, because obviously some people had needs. So they sold what they had so that nobody would have a need in the church. Because there's a lot of people there. They started out with a church of 3,000 people. And it says they spent time worshiping together daily. Daily. And then all throughout the New Testament, not just here in the book of Acts, but all throughout the New Testament, we are encouraged to focus on one another. It's not just about me, but it's about you. We're, we're encouraged to focus on one another. I don't want to overwhelm you, but I want to give you just a few verses from the New Testament that talk about the one another's. And starting with Jesus in John 13, 34, he said, A new commandment I give to you that you what? Love one another just as I have loved you. So you are also to love one another. And then Paul picks up that theme in Romans 12, 10, and he says, love one another, how? With brotherly affection. And then look at what he says next. What's he say? Outdo one another in showing honor. These are just a couple of the one another's in the New Testament. Romans 15, 7 says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Galatians 5, 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Ephesians 4, 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Colossians 3.9, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, Therefore encourage one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. James 4.11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. And James 5.9, do not grumble against one another, brothers. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 1 Peter 4.9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. How you doing? <laughs> Listen, I've just given you a few. You know there are at least 59 of these commandments in the New Testament about one another. Did you realize there were that many? You want to do a good Bible study, just look up the one another's in the New Testament sometime. We fellowship together. Jesus wants us to spend time together with each other, to care for one another, to be willing to sacrifice for each other, to give generously to each other, to share a common life all in response to what Jesus has done for us. The church is more about community than it is about independence. We experience fellowship together whenever we gather for worship or even when we gather for a meal. We fellowship together when we participate in Sunday school or Bible study or small groups or visit with each other. That's all fellowship. And fellowship can be spontaneous. You don't have to wait until your home is spick and span and, and spotless and clean. Amen? Amen. <laughs> what a relief. Fellowship is when you invite somebody over to your house, even when the laundry's all piled up. 
There's dishes in the sink. And the baby's crying. Fellowship is when your loved one dies or you're sick and your Christian friend comes over to help you out. Fellowship is getting up early for men's breakfast, amen, with other brothers to eat and study the word and pray together and confess to one another. Come on, men, say amen. Amen. Fellowship is seeing one another on the good days as well as the bad days, day in and day out, doing life together. When we do life together, that means wonderful times of encouragement and joy, but it also means times of pain and frustration. But we fellowship together because we love Jesus and We love each other. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, amen? Amen. And so we gather around God's word. We do life together. We fellowship together. And another part of our fellowship is this. We share meals and the Lord's Supper together. (coughs) Food has always been a big deal in the church, amen? Let me just point out a couple of verses from this passage. Verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And then in verse 46, which we haven't looked at yet, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So the early church ate together for meals, and what they would do, they celebrated the Lord's Supper during those meals. We see um, how they did it, how they practiced it, the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You can read more about that when you have time. But the Lord's Supper is one of the ordinances of the church, and it's something that's only for followers of Jesus Christ, and it's to be observed with humility. This is a time when we focus on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. The one who died for us once and for all. Jesus gave his life on the cross, took the wrath of God that we deserve, poured out his blood for our forgiveness. He was buried. He died. He rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. So when we come to the table, we eat the bread and we drink the cup. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Jesus is still alive. He's alive today and forevermore. And we remember his sacrifice whenever we observe the Lord's Supper. And he commanded us to do this until he comes back for us. 1 Corinthians 11.26 is where we get some of the instruction. It says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that's part of our fellowship, coming together around the Lord's table. Food is a very important part of doing life together. Jesus only gave us two ordinances. The Lord's Supper is one of them. What's the other one? Baptism. Amen? But maybe the church potluck should have been the third ordinance. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) I mean, it's always great when we have potluck meals like we did last week or, or when we have the family meals on Wednesday nights. But you can also invite somebody over to your house, maybe somebody from Zion or or family from Zion. This can be somebody you don't know very well, but it's a great way to to get to know them better. Or it might be somebody that you know well, but maybe you've just never had them over before. And if your home isn't a good place to meet, you can always take them out to eat or get together over a cup of coffee. If you happen to be new here to Zion, I just want you to know that my wife and I would love to take you out for lunch one Sunday after church, just to get to know you better. Let's just schedule a time to do that. So we see that the healthy church gathers around the Word of God. We fellowship together, we share meals together, and we share the Lord's Supper. The next thing I want you to know is that a healthy church prays together. We pray together. In the book of Acts, we find the early church praying together and praising God. Several times we see see them praying together. They used to have a saying that the the family that stays together prays together. Well, it's true about the church, too. The church that prays together stays together. Going back to verse 42, look at what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. The prayers. 
One of the authors that I like is named Gene Getz, and he has a book called Old Paths, New Power. I want to read to you something that he wrote in that book. He said, the hallmark of Western civilization has always been rugged individualism. Because of our philosophy of life, we are used to the personal pronouns I, me, and my. We have not been taught to think in terms of we and our and us. Consequently, we individualize many references to corporate experience in the New Testament, thus often emphasizing personal prayer. The facts are that more is said in the book of Acts and the epistles about corporate prayer, corporate learning of biblical truth, corporate evangelism, and corporate Christian maturity and growth than about the personal aspects of these Christian disciplines. Don't misunderstand. Both are intricately related, but the personal dimensions of Christianity are difficult to maintain and practice consistently unless they grow out of a proper corporate experience on a regular basis. See, that's why you need to be here every week. But people tell me, oh, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You've probably heard that before. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. Well, true, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but coming to church is beneficial for you, amen? Amen. We come together to worship in community and in unity of the Spirit. There is power when we pray together as the body of Christ. One key aspect of corporate prayer is that we get to encourage one another, as we've already seen in the Scripture, and spur one another on to love and good works. You can't do that if you're just one person on an island. We need each other, amen? One of the highlights of this past summer was our our prayer group that met over here before worship time. We met for an hour during the Sunday school time. And I tell you what, by the time we got done praying that hour, I felt totally prepared for worship. And I was energized to come in here and preach the Word of God afterwards. Yeah, I wish there was some way we could just do that on a regular basis. And if any of you are interested in meeting on Wednesday nights while the kids zone is going on and and the youth group and the women's bible study you know i can meet you here for prayer we can meet during that time from 6 30 to 7 30 corporate prayer is that important so what are the signs of a healthy church body already we've seen we gather around god's word we fellowship together we share meals and the lord's supper together and we pray together and the result of all of this is that we grow together We grow together. Let's pick up at verses 46 and 47. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It says they they praised God and they enjoyed favor. People were amazed at this early church. They were favorable towards this first church. And the best result of all was faith in Jesus Christ. They they met daily in the temple and in their homes. See, public church buildings like this were unknown until the third century. The early brethren in Christ, going back to Civil War times, and and for the longest time, they just met in homes and barns. Amen? It wasn't until, I think, 1871 when the first Brethren in Christ church actually built a building, and that was the Ringgold Meeting House up in Maryland. I had the privilege of speaking there some years ago. And man, that was a big deal. Some people thought that was ungodly. That's worldly to meet in a building. They had lots of discussion over that. But see, for the longest time, people just met in homes, in barns, wherever they could. But we learn from this passage here, at the time the first church was formed, there was no significant opposition to the Christians. That's why they could still come together and meet at the temple. 
The believers still enjoyed the blessing of the Jewish brethren at this point. And every day more and more people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus caused the church to grow and the people grew spiritually. This became the world's first mega church. Because you read in Acts chapter 4, there were 5,000 men in the church. Just the men. That, my friends, is a mega church. And they continued meeting there in Jerusalem until God allowed persecution to come, Acts chapter 8. And then the church scattered so that they would fulfill the commission that God had given them to take the gospel into the known world. Amen? But the result of this church family studying the word together, fellowshipping together, sharing meals in the Lord's Supper together, praying together, and growing together is so unique and distinct and wonderful that it drew others to Jesus. The way they lived positively influenced their witness out in the world. So let's check our vital signs today. How you doing so far? You don't have to answer out loud. But when it comes to the word of God, first of all, do you understand the gospel? Can you explain it to somebody else? Do you sit under the teaching of the word regularly? Do you have other brothers and sisters that hold you accountable? Do you submit to the truth and repent in light of it, or do you just brush it off when you hear it? Are you spending time in the word daily? Yeah, I said it daily. The early church clearly loved the word of God, and they loved the God of the word. Amen? When it comes to fellowship, do you have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ? That's the most important fellowship. Amen? And do you build relationships with other people in the church? Do you arrive early on Sunday mornings to interact with people? Or are you one of those ninjas? Slip in late and then excuse yourself before the service ends. I see what goes on up here. (laughs) Are you involved in the lives of others? Are you sensitive to the needs of your brothers and sisters? Are you grateful for them? And have you told them that you're grateful for them lately? And then we come to worship and prayer. Do you come to church to worship with a humble attitude? And how do you approach the Lord's table? You know, this is supposed to be a time of repentance and confession before you partake of the cup and the bread. You might even need to make things right with somebody before you partake of this. Do you pray? With your family? With your spouse? Do you pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you grateful for the privilege we have of coming together and gathering corporately? Because not everybody has this privilege. Most of our brothers and sisters around the world, they they can't meet in public like this. Don't take this for granted. And then when it comes to outreach, do you share the gospel with unbelievers? You say, now you're meddling, pastor. That's what I get paid to do. Do you share the gospel with unbelievers? Do you invite others to church? And do you serve your brothers and sisters when there is a need? And do you practice gospel-driven generosity? Yeah, I know some people have the gift of generosity, but God wants all of his people to be generous. Amen? I I love this, this picture of the early church because it's so refreshing and remarkably simple. We don't have to complicate things. Those early believers, they did the basics, and they did them well. And it's easy for us to get away from these primary activities. But we are the body of Christ, amen? So let's return to the basics, and let's partner with the Holy Spirit of God so that we 
can be a healthy church body here at Zion. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, your name is holy. Your name is wonderful. Your name is powerful. And Father, I just want to thank you that you are our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. You supply all that we need. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies through Christ Jesus. And you supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word tells us all we need to know. We get to know you through the word. We get to know about Jesus and how to be saved through the word. And as the gospel has gone forth today, I just pray that those who are not saved would realize their need for Jesus and repent and receive salvation and the free gift of God, eternal life. For those of us who have already received that gift through Jesus, help us to be devoted to the Word of God, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper, to praying together and to growing together. That's what it's all about. We want to be a healthy church. We want to be a church that honors you. We want to be a church that brings glory to your name. And so we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.